Good morning. Very nice to see you all again. Now we are going to do something extremely fun. My mom always said, life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. I'm having what the Germans call a schadengasm. City sailor want a hump hump bar, or is this getaway day and your last shot at his whiskey? Sell crazy someplace else. We're all stocked up here. It's going to disappear. One day it's like a miracle, it will disappear. You know, it could get worse before it gets better. It could maybe go away. We'll see what happens. Nobody really knows. The fact is, the greatest experts I've spoken to them all, nobody really knows. Greetings, everybody. Hello. Welcome. Thanks for joining me in my studio again today. Uh, it's good to see you all here. Got Sargon and Subod and hey, Irwin. Good to see you. Hadley, Todd, Bruce. All right. Just give them some shout outs here. Um, always appreciate you guys uh, being able to sign in and check in with me and watch me paint and draw in the studio. Um, so uh, today we're going to be doing political caricature elections right upon us it's coming up pretty soon so I thought I'd do my first caricature well have I drawn her before I guess not yeah so this weekend I started doing a bunch of uh, Kamala Harris sketches and I thought I'd do a digital painting of her today and uh, she was tough she was a tough uh, nut to crack uh, I spent a good portion of yesterday doing thumbnail sketch after thumbnail sketch and I recorded a lot of the process and I'm gonna share a time-lapse with you but uh, I didn't want to struggle with it like I did last week uh, when I did the live stream on uh, drawing uh, female subjects. Um, I, I think last week, I don't know, there was a couple good sketches I did, but most of them were pretty bad. But that, that's just a part of the process. That's part of what we all go through. All of our struggles are the same, really. You know, I don't always hit a home run right out of the gate. Um, I think the information and the, the talk and stuff that we did last week about going over problems with drawing female subjects is, is really good information um, but it just does it just highlights and underscores how sort of tricky it can be at least for a male artist like me to uh, caricature female subjects I don't think it was necessarily the issues that I brought up as being mental blocks to drawing females but uh, I don't know I just I had a hard time drawing the subjects last week I think I just tried to squeeze in too many faces in too short of amount of time and I really should have slowed down a little bit um, whenever I'm doing thumbnail sketches and it's not working, I often like to uh, switch up my process. You, you might know this if you've seen my Proco caricature course. 
But, uh, you know, if, if a line art drawing isn't working, I might switch over to doing a, you know, digital paint sketch where it's, I'm painting with blocky shapes or instead of a thin pencil, I might use a, you know, sort of an ink brush type tool, you know, something with fatter lines. You'll, you'll see some of that when I show you the Kamala Harris sketches today. Um, but uh, anyway, yeah, so I think the, I got a decent likeness of Kamala that we're going to be working on today and, you know, hope you enjoy it. Um, yeah, so I guess that's all it for the intro right here. Let's see if there's any immediate questions. Hunter says, what is your biggest hair tip for making it have depth with the head, if that makes sense? Well, I mean, in, in general, the best way to approach hair of any kind, short or long, is to first think of it as a single unit, as if it's sculpted out of clay. Just sculpt the planes of the head, of the hair. Um, if people with longer hair, like Kamala Harris, has a lot of more interesting planes. There's a top plane, side plane, bottom planes. There's local colors you have to contend with. You know, if there's highlights and lowlights, blonde versus brunette. Uh, but that's sort of a side issue. You want to think more first about the three-dimensional forms and those qualities. And build up those blocky shapes first. And then start uh, sculpting with smaller and smaller tools. Uh, with more uh, brushes that, you know, taper I think helps a lot when doing hair that's long in particular. Uh, with short hair it's a little bit different. Uh, so yeah, they definitely present their own challenges. We're going to be doing a long hair today. And maybe I'll get some time to spend on the hair so we can talk about that some more. Uh, but as always, please let me know questions in the chat. I'll try to read them and get to them as much as I can. Debbie may be able to join us today. I'm not sure. Uh, looks like she's monitoring, so that's good. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and switch over and take a look at uh, my Kamala Harris time lapses. This is going to go by pretty fast. I'll try to narrate uh, as, uh, as they're passing by. So I started with this... Uh, regular view of her just not you know just a little smile sort of regular average face uh, I'm just trying to figure her out just trying to figure out the overall proportions this is just my initial thumbnail sketch and uh, you know I am thinking about likeness but I am thinking more about the level of exaggeration and which way I want to exaggerate the face what traits stand out to me the most uh, and but I really wanted to try a variety of poses angles and expressions so there's this great picture of her with a big big smile and I really like the angle. It shows the head in a really cool three-dimensional view. It's almost a complete profile. Uh, but the likeness is just not quite there. So I, I do like the expression. It reads really well. And the three-dimensional quality of the head is okay. But I remember it is just a thumbnail sketch. I didn't spend much more than like five, six, maybe seven minutes, something like that, on each of these. Some of these have a little bit more cross-hatching and more shading. So they're going to take a little bit longer than the average thumbnail sketch. But these are thumbnails, like I said, so they're going to be sloppy, they're going to be crude. Um, I'm just trying to figure out the level of exaggeration and just what direction I want it to go in. Her face really distorts when she laughs and smiles, as it does for all of us. So it, it adds that extra layer of difficulty when trying to do a really, really strong expression. Yeah, that one doesn't look like her, like, at all. <laughs> Each smile's bigger than the last, it seems. But I'm just trying to have fun on these and just be real loose and try to just warm up. I'm only showing you a few of my sketches I did yesterday, actually. I, I have a whole bunch, but I, you know, there's just too many to show. I just had a lot of trouble trying to figure her face out. I might have taken some of these sketches and done tracings over them to try to make them better, but nothing really seemed to work. Yeah, this one, like, likeness is even getting further away, I think. But the expression is believable and funny. So I went back to the uh, original photo here. I, th I figured the um, the extreme laughing and smiling pictures were just a little too much, like, to take on all at once. So I went back to this, and I'm actually kind of happy with this likeness. I mean, it's in the neighborhood, but it, it's not quite there. It, it had potential. And as you can see here, I used, uh, I decided to switch over to more of my ink brush. Uh, for my brush set, just to get some, you know, punchier lines in there, a little bit more impact. Sometimes this shading can really help. So I actually added a little bit of shading to this one as well. Or not this one, the next one, I guess. Uh, so I decided to actually, yeah, do a caricature of that caricature. Try to take what was successful about it and make it a little bit more extreme. You know, maybe make her chin sunken into her neck a little bit more. Um, larger mouth, larger nose, uh, but 
again, you know, I did the same technique with the, the heavier pen strokes. I thought I could maybe save it. Uh, but yeah, it just wasn't quite working. Initially, you look at it and think, yeah, yeah, that's pretty good. But then you take a break, you stand up, come back to the computer, and like, oh, man, that actually is pretty terrible. Doesn't really look like her. Yeah, and here's where I thought, like, a little bit of actual just shading, shading would help. Just to see if it helps bring out the likeness. But, yeah, it didn't quite work. So then I switched over to one of my tried and true methods, which is just paint shaping. Like, paint shaping. Shape painting. Painting with blocky colors rather than with... Uh, with lines, just using um, values and edges to create the shapes. Because my mind actually works a little bit better that way. I, I don't know why that is, but, but uh, I tend to have a bit more luck when painting uh, shapes rather than drawing with lines. In my head, I really, really wanted, to, my goal was to actually do a really big smiling version of her, because I'll probably make a caricature of her with Joe and they're maybe both smiling. Uh, so that's the goal, anyway. Yeah, so this one I'm definitely feeling better about. It feels a little bit more like her. Uh, so I went ahead and uh, I, I knew there were some problems with it, some misalignments, maybe the eyes are too close together or, or whatever. Uh, so I just thought I'd clarify and restructure the drawing a little bit. So I did a line trace over. Uh, just because I needed, I, I, I want to do a painting of this. I don't want to paint on top of my rough painting. So this is my just one level of refinement that I'm doing on top of the original uh, uh, sketch painting. I thought, yeah, this is the one. At least at this point, I was basically uh, kind of had given up on like any more. I thought, you know what, that's close enough. This is the one I'm going to do for tomorrow. <laughs> and I think it's pretty close. It's not super exaggerated, uh, but I think it captures her fairly well. Um, I think the, the line art is a little bit... Um, you know, you might look at it and go, hmm, I'm not sure if that's her. I, I, I think it is. I think it's pretty good in there. It's just I have to pull it out with the paints, with the with the values and the edges. All right. Hunter Jenny, has got any tips for paint shaping? Yeah, say it right. And not shape paint shape. I tend to I don't know, get the words flipped around. Um, yeah, just use the biggest brushes you can uh, for as long as you can. Maybe start on a toned background and then work in the middle value range as long as possible. It's basically like painting, just any kind of painting, just in a really condensed, simple way. And uh, it's more like a color study when you like are in a preparation for a painting. I mean, there's no color, but uh, treat it like a color study in that there's not really a lot of super fine details you need to worry about. Because if you want to get the details back in there, like I did, uh, just do a trace over line drawing, and then you can refine that uh, shape painted sketch. Uh, with lines and uh, that I usually have to do that because I, I, I find that even though I do get pretty good likenesses when I do that uh, shape painting method um, I find that I have a lot of misalignments and wonky anatomy and wonky perspective and in doing a line art tracing sometimes flipping it over in reverse and doing a tracing will really help uh, point some of those errors out hey hello shiny um, let's see she, I like drawing lines, but there's no way anyone can just do all lines and get a face right. It's a common mistake for beginners, and then they get disappointed. Yeah, so it, it depends on, I think, on your mental state and your level of progress. Some people, you know, I think might respond better to lines and do better in their drawings if they focus on line work. Other people can develop their sketches a little more clearly if they're painting the shapes. Um, I don't know, I, I guess because I've done a lot of painting, I have that uh, in me where I... Uh, I can refine things, and my, my mind works a little more quickly when I'm painting with shapes. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, I'm going to start first with just an underlayer, uh, just a, I don't know, like a gray, warmish gray, warm orange gray color for the background. And so I've got this, the photo that I'm working from for the drawing is a really good photo. However, the colors are not great. Because I found so many different photos of her, and I'll, just, I'll actually bring some of these in here first to show you just the wide variety of skin tones that you get with Kamala Harris, just based on the lighting, based on the quality of the photo. Um, you know, here she's like more yellowish and orange on this one. Uh, here she's definitely more muted, you know, more tones of gray on this middle one, and more brownish, rosy pinks on the one on the right. So it's like, which one do I use? So I, I basically just go off my instinct about what, um, 
what I remember from her, you know, seeing her on TV and the media, the, you know, the most frequent skin coloration I tend to see. And I think the closest one is probably this one. Uh, this seems the most naturally lit. However, it's like not the right angle. You know, I can't like use it necessarily for my influence for when I'm painting, but I will sort of re refer to this. Maybe this one too, but if I refer too much to this one, I, I'm in the, you know, I run the risk of a, uh, uh, making it, you know, copying the shadow patterns that I see in here, which, you know, this is probably the closest photo to this one. Like, well, these two on the left here are actually pretty close to this one on uh, the far left. Um, but yeah, the I don't love the skin tones on this top one, even though the lighting, the shadows are more similar to what's in my primary reference photo. So it's, it's a tough choice here to try to make, but uh, I guess I'll just keep them all off to the side here and I'll just make my decisions based on, I don't know, I guess, I guess mostly this one, this one here. Because um, this one's just a little too yellow. Maybe I can actually uh, alter the color. Even though it's a JPEG and I don't have that great a control, I might be able to uh, uh, do some color balancing here on the fly. And I do this a lot in my own work when I'm working with difficult photos. I'll try to figure out what uh, is the best color range to work in and if there's one photo that's better than another I'll uh, do that hmm. Let, let's actually let's also let's um I'll see if I can change it on here too on the original reference photo because that would be ideal if I could get the original reference photo uh, to be in a good uh, range of value and color I don't think tell the shifts I'm making so I'm changing the color pretty obviously right there um, but it's really just small nudges I just need to like work within the, um, the color spectrum here Probably should have done this ahead of time but you know I, I think it's good to see this sort of thing because it is one of the problems you might encounter in your own work and it's good to know how to figure out ways around it and it's not not awesome. A little, it's a little better. Let's see if I can actually darken it just a little bit as well. I'll use the levels and maybe drag the uh, middle slider to the right a little bit to get a little bit more contrast on her face. Because it's it's not ideal. It's not a great color uh, scheme to work from in this photo. Yeah, I don't want to make the darks too dark because then I'll lose all the detail in the hair. But, I don't know, I think I took away some of like the, I don't know, it had a bit of pinkness to it that I think that's maybe gone now. Anyway, so I'll just do my best. Um, I'm going to just interpret the color. That, this is why I don't like selecting colors directly from photos when I'm working. It's one of the reasons. Um, because oftentimes you get just a, a really bad piece of color photo reference and if you were to copy it exactly, it just wouldn't look great. It would not make for a good painting. Massive shoulder pads. Yeah, that's a good idea. I'll probably end, yeah, end up doing a body with her later, maybe during the week. I'll do some kind of body situation, like maybe, yeah, again, draw her with Joe, draw her in the pantsuit. But uh, um, yeah, this week I'm just going to focus on the head. All right, so let's get a uh, average value for her face here. And use that also as an underpainting. Do it underneath the line art layer. I'm going to go just opt for be a little bit darker than the average value, I think. If you start with too light of a value on the face, it skews everything too light. It's better to skew things a little bit too dark, I think, in my honest opinion, when painting in the beginning. Uh, because it's, especially with working with uh, traditional paints, like oils and stuff, it's a lot easier to lighten up a color later if it's too dark rather than trying to darken a color if there's too much you know, light white paint on the surface. It'll just, it'll, it'll tint everything. All that, that white is really powerful on canvas. At least titanium white is. It's out of focus. Uh, you know, it might be a problem with the uh, stream, the stream quality. Right now it looks pretty healthy. But yeah, let me know if the picture quality degrades or anything, guys. Okay. Maybe go a little bit darker on the shadow side of her face here, maybe a little warmer. I 
But I just like to think of the head first as just like a simple egg shape, you know, shaded from dark to light. Like a nice easy progression. And I paint into the big shapes as much as possible with, you know, just globally thinking about what's happening with the head and not really worrying about the uh, details yet or the smaller plane changes. Okay, your hair, I'm gonna paint that in. I'm actually gonna opt for a little bit more chromatic and a little lighter for the hair though, um, just because it's it's what I normally do when I'm doing a traditional type painting is I do a really warm, dark underpainting first and then uh, I can scumble on lighter or cooler values on top of that. And there's a really nice interplay between warm and cool colors. So the painting process has begun. I'm thinking about layers, essentially. Painting is all about layers and layering and putting paint on top of other colors and values of paint. That's how you get the complexity and the subtlety. And let's go ahead and paint in her uh, top as well with the same color. Might as well give it an even base tone so it's all sort of uniform. Okay. Maybe add a little bit of darkness underneath the chin and neck here. Okay, and I'm just going to sort of paint some you know, I'm still underneath the line art layer, so I'm just going to sort of stain in some more interesting colors. And when I say stain, I mean, like, this is what I would be doing with oil paint. I would be thinning down the paint with thinner or water, you know, or whatever the medium is. And, um, and just put in some interesting local notes of color around the face. Maybe a little cooler in the forehead, maybe some, uh, maybe some pink, so that's a little too light. Maybe a little more red near the cheeks. This is just, I'm getting a little bit of variety in the painting before really, really starting to paint, just because it makes it a little bit more interesting. You know, the lips can be a brighter red than they're going to end up being. That's okay, too. Maybe a little purple around the eyes. She has actually does have some reddish, brownish, you know, eyeshadow on. Maybe purple is a little too strong, but you know, it's just underpainting. We'll paint over it. A little bit of coolness around the eyes generally is a good thing on most people, whether it's purple or blues or greens. Okay, let's go ahead and just start painting on top of the actual line art layer now, like on the line art layer, not on a layer above it, because uh, what I plan to do is uh, get some dark, dark lines in here to reaffirm some of these lines. For the eyes here, I'm just going to take a dark brownish red color and just paint over the pencil strokes that were there. Hey, there's Debbie. Have you answered any questions about shadows? 
Um, no, not yet. Okay. Uh, you were talking about the shadows under the eyes. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hunter Jennings was asking, what is a safer bet when adding shadows with slight hue shifts? Should you go warmer or cooler? Oh, good question. And I have a real simple answer for that. Warmer. In most situations, uh, for the darkest shadows on the face, like in the nostrils and the eyes and uh, the corners of the mouth, warmer is always generally going to be the best bet. Um, it, it depends on your overall color sensibility and, you know, the uh, the overall color harmonies you're going for in the painting. It might, you know, a warm, dark, reddish black might be out of place. But in most cases, if you're painting a very naturalistic painting, it's going to look really good because um, a coolish, a cool black, black that has blues or greens or purples in it that's too cool, it, 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 it pops out. It kind of comes forward. It doesn't recede. Um, because I guess, you know, most of us humans have red blood under our skins. There's overall generally a warmth to the darkest shadows, like inside the nose especially. You'll see a lot of warmth because uh, it'll have a lot of bounce light, reflected light inside of the nose that might actually pick up some real reds and might, might not even be that dark really when it comes down to it. So I have a question on that though. Hmm. So a lot of uh, people, especially when they get older, the skin underneath their eye usually becomes thinner and you can actually see a balloonness. Mm -hmm. Sometimes would that change your mind as far as shadows? Would you still do a warm shadow? Well, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, there, I was just talking about how there should be cools around the eyes, actually. Um, ah, sorry, I missed that. But like, you know, the bags of the eyes and the, you know, I, I, I tend to have sort of slightly cooler undertones underneath my eyes, my eye bags. Um, but I'm just talking about the shadow shadows, like the line for the eyelashes, you know, or the eyes are scrunched down, or the mouth is open. You see inside the corners of the mouth. Uh, those are going to be the darkest, uh, uh, warm darks, I think. Yeah. I'm using the ink brush here, which I usually don't do when I'm painting on the face, but I do kind of like it for reaffirming some of my lines, line work, and uh, some of the wrinkles on the face. Because it's making a very strong statement. Okay, and we'll switch over now to a paintbrush. Um, maybe my Laguna Filbert brush, it's just, which is sort of a hard, streaky brush. And now I'm just sort of uh, working in the half tones, just starting to bring up the values um, from dark to light, or, well, you know, working in the middle range generally but I start a little bit on the darker halftone side because I like to build up to my lights. So Paul London was asking, and I'm not sure if he's asking in general terms or just about this image here. If you were to make a list of features, what would stand out? Um. Yeah, that, that's always a good exercise. Like I did one of the lessons in my Proco course again, uh, is making a checklist of features if you're not really sure what to draw or exaggerate. Um, so I usually start with the way that I actually draw when I make my list. So I'll start with and asking myself, what about the head shape? Well, to me, it's it's a long head shape, but definitely like a sort of a diamond shape where her, the widest point is her cheeks, especially when she smiles, and a very narrow, weak, uh, jowl and jawline that sort of blends into the neck um, and especially again during certain expressions where she's you know compressing her chin into her neck that becomes even more obvious uh, I would say her um, you know her eyes aren't particularly close together or far apart that's not really like an issue with her um, just sort of average uh, her nose is maybe a little a little larger than average but more importantly is the shape the shape is really important to get right where it's a slightly um, a bit of a slight bump to the nose down at the end of the bridge where it meets the nasal cartilage and sort of sort of like a beak-like nose in that shape you know it's not like a ski slope nose it doesn't come out at the ball it just you know it, it comes out the, the highest point is the middle midpoint of the bridge 
um, and the nostrils are higher up than the ball of the nose in most angles. And uh, I think a larger than average mouth and teeth, for sure, uh, especially when she smiles. Politicians tend to have, you know, very big smiles that they've cultivated. You know, they, they're known a lot for that because they want to look happy and friendly. So that, that's actually a common trait among a lot of politicians, I think. And it's just more how we see them, how, the, how, we, how we see them in the media is the big smiley face. And uh, kind of a weak chin, I guess. Uh, not, not super weak, but not, definitely not a strong chin. Uh, there are other more important features on her face to make bigger. So that's sort of my quick Kamala checklist. And I guess Hello Shiny uh, said there is a good live stream that you did on doing the list. Oh yeah, that's right. Thanks for the reminder. Yeah. So I have another question for you. Uh -huh. Alan's asking, do you use the law of constancy and T-shaped theory as used by Tom Richmond to maintain exaggeration in that distortion? Um, I don't really know how that works. People have asked me about that before, and I have Tom's book, but I haven't really fully read that section. Um, I, I think I understand what the T theory is, but no, I do not. Um, I, the, I think what I read about it, I was like, well, if you have the eyes a certain width apart, the nose has to be a certain length, and it's like one or the other, and it's like this weighted system, like if you pull the eyes closer together, the nose can drop down or raise up. I, I forget exactly how it goes. But uh, no, that doesn't really appeal to me. That doesn't really speak to me and how I draw and how I like to look at faces. Um, it might help you, but you know, it depends on your own particular artistic temperaments, I guess, and what you see when you look at the face. Maybe you look at things and see things the way Tom does. But uh, no, I just I'm a very just organic drawer, drawer to designer when I design my caricatures. They're just I'm just responding to what I see in the moment, and it's not really based on any kind of universal laws, other than I just I, I want it to look like a real person, like it could be animated in a three dimensional way. So I just like to have that kind of reality uh, in in my drawings. And you don't have to to make good caricatures. You don't have to. I don't have to have a realism or really good perspective or anatomy. That's that's not what it's always about. But it is for me, just because that's the kind of art that I like. So Paul's asking another question again. Um, this one I think you'll have an answer for. Uh, do you have a maximum of features to exaggerate so things don't get messy, or do you exaggerate everything that is eligible? Yeah. Exaggeration is all about comparison, right? I mean, I just do what works. And I try to get away with as much exaggeration as I can. That's sort of my, you know, goal. It just, you know, I don't end up drawing as exaggerated as some of my, you know, more esteemed colleagues who are really good at exaggeration. Um, but, uh, you know, I try. Uh, but yeah, I don't have a set limit or anything like that. Um, that. That seems like an arbitrary thing to set up for yourself you know, a certain number of features to exaggerate. So, yeah, no, I don't. I don't. So what brush are you using now? I'm still using my, um, the brush I started with, well, when I started painting properly, which is the, uh, um, Laguna Filbert brush, which is in my brush set. It's a good uh, just general painting brush because it's kind of like streaky and it makes it look like a painting. It doesn't look super digital. Uh, this one doesn't have any texture applied to it. I do like the texture brush, but uh, I'll save that for a little bit later. And, you know, I have a lot of uh, choices with her shirt here, or her uh, blazer. Um, she got this sort of bright royal blue that she's wearing, uh, but the other paintings, yeah, I'm sorry, the other photos she's not. She's wearing, like, grays and blacks. But, you know what, I'll just stick with the blue for now, I guess. I'll just lay in that blue color. And I like to do it sort of early on in the painting like this because it might help inform the other color decisions to have the blue in there right away. If I wait too long, 
and then put the blue in later, uh, the blue might look, look totally out of place. Uh, but when I do it early like this, it allows me the opportunity to uh, um, maybe put some blues in the face to help bounce off that and reflect that uh, light and reflect those colors. I mean, not reflect in a realistic way, but just, you know, it'll, it'll force me to put some more blues in the face. Otherwise, the face might run the risk of becoming too sort of monochromatic and warm all over. See, now that I put that blue in there, her face looks like super orange brown, like all these earth tones. And now I can get away with putting cooler tones in her face if I want. Because that, that blue in there was um, is like the strongest blue, and nothing I do on the face will be that blue. But it'll give me a sort of license to do a little bit more color variety than I might otherwise feel allowed to do. And I wanted to get like sort of the brightest bright on the painting in there too. I'm looking at some of the other photo reference right now, actually not the main one, but this one in particular has some really good like highlights and uh, shadows on it. So I, I like how three dimensional it makes the face look. Her uh, um, the other photo is a little more flatly lit. You know, I might just say heck with it and actually just use this as my color reference. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll just keep it here on on screen since I have a little bit of extra room here. All right. Oh, that means I need to actually move this over. There we go. So this lighting on her, I would say, is a very cool light source. Uh, so her shadows are going to be warmer by comparison. Just keep that in mind as uh, as you work on your own paintings, like what color temperature is the light. So earlier, when you mentioned you were struggling with the Kamala. Kamala Sorry. Kam Kamala. 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 Right? Kamala and La. Yeah. With the Kamala drawings. Uh, Bruce Gonzalez was wondering, did you use the Riley abstraction? Just curious. No, I didn't use the Riley abstraction on any of these Kamala drawings. Um, after I got the, uh, the final iteration uh, that I created with the painted shapes, I was pretty tired and I was just like, I don't want to do a whole abstraction on top of this. So, so I just basically did a tracing, uh, trying to correct it uh, manually, just visually without the abstraction. The abstraction is a great tool and I use it a lot, but not all the time. It just depends on my mood. This was kind of an interesting question. I don't know. Excuse me. Do you ever feel creepy or awkward analyzing and staring at people's faces and thinking about how you can draw them? <laughs> no, not at all. I love staring at people. <laughs> uh, I mean, I've done it. I've gotten in front of people for years drawing live quick sketch, and that's a little unnerving at first. You know, when you get starting to get used to like drawing people live, just staring at them for five, six, seven minutes at a live event. Uh, so that you get over it pretty fast though because you realize you just have to you just have to focus on your task focus on your drawing uh, It can be unnerving for a lot of guests that sit in front of you though They're they kind of don't know where to look and they don't want to look at you, you know drawing kids too They can be sometimes pretty freaked out by the 
concept of a stranger sort of looking at them a few feet away. Um, so it's it's usually more an issue for the a live person. Really. But no, yeah, I mean this is just a photo, so yeah, I don't care. It's not alive. It's not like one of the Harry Potter photos that are that'll talk back to you. Another question for you. Do you ever have a mother color to connect all the colors to harmonize the composition? Um, I mean, I don't refer to it as that, but I guess I see what you're saying. And for me, I guess that would be sort of the base tone that I lay down underneath the line art layer, that sort of warm orangish red, um, which you can kind of see. Well, I, I painted over a lot of it, but um, that would be sort of the unifying color for, um, for that. Yeah. But uh, I mean, oftentimes it can be the background color. If there's a like, if the, if the person is in a really weird background where it's like bright blue or green, maybe that's something that will permeate everything. Like I think my uh, painting of Arnold Schwarzenegger um, that I did, it's actually on the masthead of my YouTube page, uh, but only part of it because YouTube crops it in a weird way. That had a super bright blue background, and um, I just I think I painted that whole thing with that blue sort of just lingering there in the background. So. If that wasn't there, all my color choices would have been different. If I had had like an orange or a brown or a blue, you know, or a red background, any other color, it would have affected things differently. So in that sense, I guess, yeah, that might be a mother color. If that's, I don't know, yeah, I haven't heard, heard that term before. Okay, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit now. I've got most of the face sort of blocked in in a very crude way, uh, but I'll maybe start focusing on some features now, switching a brush over to another brush. Let's try the velvet brush. Well, I'm really at a, I'm in a tough spot here because of the, uh, the color choices of these two photos. Um, I, I know objectively the photo on the right, you know, with the more muted colors is better, uh, but, uh, the, the one that I did the uh, drawing from doesn't have, you know, it's very, very different. It's like I can't really combine the two choices. It would just look too incongruous. So I don't know. You know, I guess I am opting towards this uh, this photo just because, I don't know, I mean, the hair is different. That'll, that could cause me a problem. I might have to repaint the hair if I use this as my photo reference. But she's got the same pearls on, so... Uh, I think it'll be a little bit easier to make this jump, you know, from to this from my original reference photo to this one for the lighting. So let me um, let's minimize this just a little bit, and then I can make this a little keep that off to the. Uh, yes, we can see both, but um, yeah, you're, you're watching me in real time here, sort of have this discussion with myself about what I really need to do. I think I'll go ahead and just go ahead and do it. I'll do it underneath though. Start with the uh, shadow colors here uh, underneath the line art layer. Of course, there's layers of paint on top of it already, so can't really see all of those cool colors showing through for the dark shadows. But at least it'll get me started, just to have some base color there underneath the line art. So now I'll switch back up to the layer above that. So I need to take it some dark paint here and uh, redraw some of the darkest shapes with this new dark shadow color. So when I do something like this, again, I'll just start from the big shapes again. Uh, rather than worrying about the smaller details and the minutia. 
because it's important to get the canvas sort of blocked in with the new value decisions, the new color decisions that I'm making here, rather than just focusing on small features. Okay, so it's kind of done now. It's kind of finished in that sense. So I am now going to move into the uh, uh, bringing in the uh, smaller shapes. I think these uh, creases and folds of fat underneath her chin and neck are really critical to her likeness. Um, because if you don't, it's going to make her look too sort of slim. Um, and, you know, she's not overweight or anything, but, you know, she's got sort of loose skin under there, so you gotta indicate that. And this is something I noticed that's really odd about her um, nasal labial folds here. She has, like, two sets of nasal labial folds. There's one that, the natural one, that sort of branches out from the tops of her nostrils. Um, but then she has, like, this secondary plane change down here, which is in all the photos, I noticed. Um, and it, it might be, I'm just a theory here, she might have some, you know, wrinkle filler or silicone injection or something, and it's just distorting those shapes. I don't know, she's in, she's in the public eye a lot and probably wants to look young, so it's possible. But it just could be genetically just what she looks like. I'd have to see younger photos of her to know for sure. Either way, that is a, it's a weird trait about her face that if you don't pick up on it, you might miss out, if you miss out on that subtlety, there might be something wrong with the face and you won't know what it is. So it's important to catch the little weird things like that. She is from California, so <laughs> the chances of her having some type of, not necessarily plastic surgery, but maybe a yeah, filler or a, you know, face peel is probably pretty high. Yeah. yeah. And as a caricature artist, I often see people's faces that have work done and they sometimes they can look a little, you know, unnatural in places because of that. Um, you know, like when especially when the face makes an expression. I was just reading in some uh, literature about uh, the fat compartments on the face, the fat pads that everybody has, and one of the things cosmetic surgeons often do uh, to make people look younger is they actually sever the septum that separate the fat pads on the face uh, to give the face a more smoothed out look because as you get older you you know the the, the, uh, the highs and lows the peaks and valleys on your face get more increased uh, get more uh, noticeable because um, I don't just gravity and the let me the love fat and collagen yeah so the uh, so they'll actually sever there's actually little walls called septum that uh, divide the fat compartments on the face and they'll actually sever their anchors to the, from the bone uh, so that the fat pads are sort of intermingling and floating free. <laughs> and uh, I guess it gives the effect of a more smoothed out look, but then when the face moves and makes expressions, it's a little bit different from what we normally would see on a person. Not that it's a bad thing, it's just something that, you know, it's good to be aware of when you see it and what's happening. So, as I said earlier, I was I tried to do earlier, I wanted to sort of focus on a few features to start to bring them up, make them a little more um, rendered and refined. So, let's go start with just one of these eyes here. I always like to get something done a little bit earlier for you guys so it looks a little nicer. It's a little more finished. You can see, in, you know, you can see visually what I'm thinking in my head. You know, I'm, when I'm painting, I'm a little more patient and I, you know, I wait for those moments, you know, to, to bring the, you know, to resolve something. 
but uh, when you're painting for the public, you know, you want to have something in there for people to look at earlier on, I think. It's called showmanship. <laughs> also, just because I am trying to convey concepts too, not necessarily my entire painting process, but you need to help people who are viewing this, you know, in their own painting struggles. Like, how do you make that leap from, you know, the rough block-in stage to a more finished look? Because that is a, a, a point of hang-up for a lot of people, is actually making the things look good, making them look real, making them look finished and artistically interesting. I have a person that just came in the chat that you know, Court. Who's that? Kourash from Atlanta. Oh, hey, Kourash. Wants to know what's the name of your tablet, the size, and are you using Photoshop? Yes, I'm in Photoshop, and I'm working on my desktop Cintiq. It's the, a little bit of an older model, the 22-inch HD. I think you can actually still buy it off their site, though. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not on, like, a tablet PC. I'm actually on my home PC just with the Cintiq connected to it. I have another question from Carlton Bird. He's wanting to know, do you find it harder painting lighter or darker skin tones? Hmm. I never really, I never really thought about it. Um, I mean, I paint more lighter skin tones in general just because, I don't know, there just tends to be the jobs that I get and the people in my portfolio. Um, but, I mean, fundamentally, there's no difference in concept. It's just, you know, looking at the reference photo and uh, figuring out the lighting temperature uh, and just resolving the forms, you know, as long as you're observant and have good photos to work from. Uh, in this case, I'm working from a couple different photos, and I just settled on this one finally. Um, yeah, it's it's not really that much more difficult or anything to paint darker skinned people. I mean, it might mentally throw you off a little bit if you're not used to it, because you think, oh, wait, you know, I always use this same color mixture for the faces, like the Caucasian faces that I paint, and what do I do now? So, yeah, but once you start doing it, you realize it's not really a big deal. Same concepts apply, like, you know, starting with a, a good underpainting value, maybe a, it might be a little bit darker on a darker skin person, and then uh, start working within the half tone range, uh, get some, you know, key dark shadows in there soon, get some key lights in there soon, any strong colors like the blue blazer, uh, maybe get that in there early on in the process so you have these other colors in the painting already to judge off of. I think I might. Did I do a stream on painting different skin tones? And, you know, I did. Um, I spent a little bit of time on that on my uh, on my stream where I it was the color theory stream. Um, the, the most of the stream was actually talking about color theory and color wheels and hue, value, and chroma. And then the last you know twenty minutes or so, I think, or last half hour roughly, I uh, I did a couple different block in like uh, color studies of different facial tones. So yeah, maybe check that out. That, that was actually one of my more popular streams that still gets a lot of views. And I think it's pretty valuable information in there too. I, I worked a long time getting that stream ready, <laughs> preparing the uh, materials. Because color theory is a bit of a, it can be a, you know, a bear of a subject. But the way I teach it and the way I look at it isn't, you know, it's not as hard as you might think it is, or as dense of a subject. It can actually be quite simple. Are you working just on one layer right now? Yeah, yeah. Um, I have my layers palette hidden, but yeah, so this is generally what it looks like here. I just have the background uh, gray layer, which is just flat color, then the underpainting, which I did underneath the line art, and then I have the line art layer itself, which is what I'm painting on now. So, um, I mean, I could combine these two, actually. In fact, I'll go ahead and pick, combine these two. There's no reason to have two layers at this point of color. So let's merge those. And yeah, so it's just all in one layer now. That's how, I, that's how I prefer to paint most of my stuff, just on a few layers or, you know, as few layers as possible. The only exception being if, you know, if there's going to be multiple figures, complicated backgrounds, stuff where, like, an art director might want me to change stuff, I like to keep things a little bit flexible, so I might do a few more layers than I would normally do for my own work when working for clients. I 
have a request wanting to know who has the best anatomy books on the face? Carlton Bird is asking. Um, well, I learned the most about the face initially when I taught uh, features and facial expressions at the, the Watts Atelier many years ago from the Elliot Goldfinger book on human anatomy for artists, I think is what it's called. Uh, Goldfinger is the last name. He has a book on animal anatomy too. I haven't seen that, but it should be pretty good. He actually, you know, did dissections and, you know, studied. I think he was a sculptor by trade and wrote this book on human anatomy. It's, it's awesome. There's a section just on the face and facial muscles. Uh, but there's another great book out there too now, and you can either buy a hard, you know, an actual physical copy or the um, PDF version, and it's called Anatomy of Facial Expressions, I think. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll put that down in the description later after the video. Um, but it's really, really good illustrations. It's not as text heavy as the Elliot Goldfinger book. The Goldfinger book has amazing, great text, and this uh, Anatomy of Facial Expressions has uh, like 3D models that have been used as the illustrations, so they're really, really clear as to like what's going on, what they're illustrating. And, um, and there is helpful text, but it's not as in-depth as the Goldfinger books. So I would say maybe get both of those. Because that's what I have, and that's what I recommend. Lyle himself is asking, have you done a Joe Biden caricature yet? I've done a few Bidens over the years. Um, you can see a couple of them on my website, I think, my courtjones.com. What about the book? Yeah, well, I did, like, the first one I did of Biden was when he and Obama won in 08. Um, it was, like, for a company that wanted me to put them on a sports card, like a trading card. So it was a sports theme. So it was, like, uh, Gatorade being dunked on Obama with Biden in the background. And that was my, that was a really fun picture of Biden. I like that, how that turned out. Um, and then, yeah, last year I did some illustrations for a book project um, where uh, uh, it's like sort of like a graphic novel and a collection of stories about Biden and Obama traveling through time, traveling through the multiverse, trying to save history. And uh, so they had me paint and draw um, Obama and Biden as different pop culture figures, like uh, from you know the Blues Brothers, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, and Titanic. Of course, he wanted me to paint them at the age they would have been at those times that those movies came out. So it's like a really young Obama and a really young Biden for the Butch Cassidy illustration. So it doesn't really look like what you think of Joe Biden. I had to find pictures of him from the very early 70s. And same thing with uh, Barack. He was pretty young then. I think he was a teenager. <laughs> and looks like that book is available on Amazon. And what's the name of that book? Uh, it's by Adam Reed, R-E-I-D, The Adventures of Barry and Joe. Obama and Biden's romantic battle for the soul of America. Yeah, the soul, the battle for the soul of America. You know, I, I that book came out in, you know, the initial concept for that came out even like a year before that. And uh, it's kind of funny, Biden actually uses that as part of his campaign slogan. I think it's like battle for the soul of the country or something. And I, he, I don't know, I think he might have got it from the guy Adam's book. Which maybe, maybe he's a fan. <laughs> That'd be cool if he was. So I know a lot of times when I draw either in Procreate or if I'm in Photoshop, I tend to use a lot of layers because I'm afraid if I don't, that I'll mess something up and regret it later. But you don't seem to have that issue. Uh, no, because I believe in the concept of painting with consequences, um, because it, then it forces you to paint more accurately. <laughs> um, uh, because, and it's something I learned just from painting with oils, because they're you know, you don't have layers, you don't have safety nets when you're painting in real media. And that's how I basically learned to paint first was with real media. And I just got in that habit. Um, and I think personally, I paint better when I'm painting in oils. Uh, I think it's like my paintings take longer for me to turn out and make them look good when I'm working digitally because I'm painting without consequences. Even if I'm working in one layer, it's super, super simple to just paint over something. Whereas with oils, you got to worry about, you know, paint buildup and color contamination and things like that. So you think more carefully about each stroke when you're working in oils. 
Uh, plus, you have to stop constantly, go back to the palette and mix your colors. You have to make very conscious decisions about each single stroke you make because you have to reload that brush every single time. When you're painting digitally, it's really easy to just gloss over a lot of those decisions that you would be making more carefully uh, when, you're, when working with a traditional material set. So, um, yeah, and I just, you know, with, also with experience comes more confidence, too. Just the more I paint, the more I realize it's really easy to fix stuff, even if it is you know, traditional materials, you can fix anything. Uh, except with watercolors, you know, you're kind of screwed there if you mess up too bad because <laughs> they're transparent and you can't cover them up. Okay, because the color choosing process is very different digitally than it is with the traditional materials. Um, here I'm just, I have this color picker window. I can select colors from my other colors on the canvas that are already there. And um, it definitely affects how things come out. You know, I, I tend to think my oil paintings tend to have more color harmonies in them, a little bit more maybe limited or muted color palettes uh, because I am working with physical limitations of, of real oil paints. Whereas with digital, you can pick any color in the spectrum. I try not to. I still try to mimic that same look when painting digitally, but. Uh, it's more of a struggle, actually, painting digitally to try to get good color harmonies. There are ways to trick yourself, though. You know, you can set up color palettes in, in the window, you know, off to the side. You can just say, put that color there for the skin, that color for the hair, this color for the lips, and just, you know, select from those three photos, you can, or those three colors. You can give yourself those artificial limitations when working digitally. You can set up roadblocks for yourself, uh, and that's another way to go, for sure. You just have to figure out what your weaknesses are when you're painting, if you have any, and then figure out ways to help overcome them through the tools that are available to you. So I have a question from Sondo Okra. He's asking, um, so say you have a reference image that has a lot of potential to exaggerate, but the thumbnail sketch just isn't working. Should I give more time to working on that same image, or should I try finding another reference? Well, depends on how okay you are with banging your head into a wall over and over again. Because um, <laughs> that's what it feels like sometimes if you know, you're working from the same photo reference over and over and you really, really want it to work, and you're, you've done 20 drawings from it, maybe it is time to switch to a new reference photo. Um, but it depends on the job. You know, maybe it's a job where you have only one photo reference because that's what the client gave you, or for whatever reason they say, legally we can only use this one photo, who knows? Um, and that might be something where you have to work around it, but that's rare. I mean, you can almost always, in most situations in this life as an artist, you can always figure, you can always work from whatever photo reference you want as long as it works within the context of the illustration. Like you might need to have the subject facing left, for instance, if they're that's where they're at in the composition, so that might limit you. But yeah, just um, one of the techniques I use if I'm having trouble uh, with a face and I can't quite get it is I will switch to a new reference photo. What about uh, turning it upside down or trying to get another you know perspective on the reference photo you have? The turning upside down thing never. I don't like that. I mean, I, I know that was in that famous art book, Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. It's more of an exercise about getting out of your analytical frame of mind. Um, but to me, that's not what caricature is about. To me, about caric caricature is about um, being just better at analyzing and, and interpreting a photo. And uh, to me, that would be just too confusing to try to draw a face upside down. It would like, yeah, it would just, it would just confuse me more than anything, I think. I've never tried it for caricature, honestly. <laughs> Um, maybe you should. Maybe. Be interesting to see what happens. Doesn't maybe. mean it would help you any, but. Alfred Reed has joined us. Hey, hello, Alfred. He's from Dublin, Dublin, Ireland. Uh, he's wanting to know what is the best digital device you can recommend for first time drawing on digital? Do whatever tab tablet you can afford and you have space for. Um, it doesn't have to be a huge, you know, Cintiq model made by Wacom. There's even other brands that, you know, that like Huion, I think, and 
I can't. I don't even know all the different brand names. Um, I mean, everyone that I heard that uses them say they're good. They're not as good as Wacom products generally, but they're good. They're, they'll definitely suffice, and they can be like a fraction of the cost of a, of a Wacom product. Um, but I've always used Wacom. I don't know. They they seem to have it figured out pretty well, and you know, I spend all my time painting at the computer. You know, so it's it's an investment that's worth getting a good piece of. Uh, you know, getting a good piece of technology to do it. You know, big enough for me. That's a big screen. I had a really, really tiny Intuos tablet for years, and that's how I did all my digital paintings. And you know, I think I still have it. <laughs> um, I might be getting rid of it soon. I might be having a sale on some of my tablets um, that I just need to clear out of the house because I don't use them anymore. So maybe I'll put them on my Facebook page as like a for sale thing. Are you gonna autograph them? Ha <laughs> ha. Mm -hmm. Um. I find, just from my personal experience, that if you start working on another type of tablet, like say a Huon or an X-Pen, and have never worked on a Wacom before, you're not going to know what you're missing. So it's not until you actually go to a Wacom product and then say, hey, wait, this touch feels a lot more responsive than the other tablets were, from my experience. But also, I have an iPad, and I've been working in Procreate and uh, Sketch Club and a few other programs like Fresco, and I just love how easy it is to port around. You know, it's a lot lighter than my Cintiq Companion. The programs are pretty easy to use. They're not really expensive at all, so that's another thing to possibly think about. But there are limitations with the iPad that you need to be aware of, there such are. as the... Um, well, connectivity is one. It's, it's, it's a little more limiting if you want to actually connect to your computer. It can be done. But then if you want to get on a Zoom call, it's, it's, it's a little more complicated than working on a Wacom tablet with a PC. We run into that issue. And um, the uh, pen battery life, uh, the Wacom tablets, uh, the Wacom pens don't have any batteries. They're just... The, it's not the technology they use. The uh, Apple pencils only last a few hours. And if you want to paint all day, you have to like stop and... Wait for the pencil to recharge. Yeah, that's probably my biggest problem right now with the iPad is I do get really into painting or drawing and then, oh, I have to recharge my pencil. Now, granted, I have a first generation iPad, I think. So you actually have to plug that into the port. The newer ones, you just kind of... First generation iPad Pro, not first generation Correct. iPad. Correct. <laughs> sorry. First generation iPad Pro. Um, but the newer versions, I think it just attaches on the side. So it's a little bit easier and probably charges a little quicker. But I don't know how long the pin lasts on the newer ones. So I have a newer iPad Pro with a pencil that charges on the side, but like I never use it. <laughs> Someone's asking, how do you make a digital painting look so traditional? Um, there's a lot of techniques. Uh, you can. After my stream here, go check out my video on the Proco YouTube page called, um, I think it's the title is How to Make Digital Paintings Look Traditional. Uh, it wasn't part of my caricature course, it was just a one-off video I made, but it has a bunch of good tips in there, like, you know, top 10 list sort of thing. Um, but just, you know, in, to sum it up, um, the main concept is to just treat it like a traditional painting. Do a lot of the same things. Set limitations for yourself. Set up a limited palette. Uh, use brushes that have a lot of texture and streakiness to them. Um, my, I, I have a brush set actually. If, I don't know if you know how familiar I am with the stream here. I've been talking about it a few weeks, but you can go to my website or to Gumroad and um, download my brush set that is it's specifically designed to make traditional looking type strokes. You know, there's a lot of textured brushes, a lot of streaky brushes. And uh, what else? Uh, you could work on a textured surface. You know, you actually paint on top of an actual canvas image. You can uh, stay zoomed out as long as possible on a painting. Don't zoom in too much because it forces you to work on details. And when you stay zoomed back, you end up having a more painterly painting, paintings with more visible brush strokes, just because you can't really see them when you're zoomed out all the way. Like, I'm not doing that right now. I'm actually zoomed in quite a bit here, but also, it's also because I, you know, I want you guys to kind of see better what I'm doing. But I do try to stay zoomed out on paintings as long as possible and not zoom in unless I absolutely need to.
Because what makes painting, I think, look traditional is, is the messiness. It's the interaction of layers of paint, being able to see paint colors through like, the holes or the, the grain or the canvas visible brush strokes. And so your process should try to mimic that process and you produce those kinds of results. You know, you layer paint on top of other colors, you get contrasting colors and values in, a, in the same area. And it'll have that illusion of complexity or the illusion of a traditional uh, rendering. So do you have anything else uh, that you're working on right now in the um, studio? Am I? Do I? Um, I don't know. I'm just curious. Um, I'm just doing some client work, that, um, just some commission pieces, nothing illustration-wise. Um, Hunter was asking about landscapes. I guess he doesn't realize that this isn't the only thing that you do. Yeah, I, um, I, mean, I, yeah, I frequently do landscapes. I haven't this whole year pretty much because of lockdown. Um, I'm a little wary about going out into public to paint because if you're in a populated area or a touristy area, you always get people coming up right up behind you that want to talk to you and ask you about the painting. And I just I don't want people to come close to me <laughs> when I'm outside. And that's not digital. You usually do traditional plein air. Yeah, I, I never do digital outdoors. I tried it a little bit just when I first got my laptop and Cintiq tab, you know, or Intuos tablets years ago. But uh, yeah, I, I prefer oil painting, like plein air oil painting. There are places I can go around town though that are in the back country. You know, some of the trails and nature preserves that don't see a lot of traffic and you can always set up in a way that you know you can see people coming from a mile away so i, I might do that soon because i really do love painting landscapes and it's really really good training uh for any kind of art really is like painting landscapes maybe you could get some caution tape and put up <laughs> maybe put up an area of, you know stay away area because people always seem to just creep up out of nowhere don't they and just hey what are you working on Oh yeah, my aunt's a painter. You know, oh, yeah, that's my, great. <laughs> my kids study in art. Yeah, people like to talk. Can't blame them, but kind of difficult now. So I'm gonna go ahead and get a nice blue highlight in her eye here. Blue because the light source is cool. If it was a warm, like, tungsten light, I might do, you know, a yellowish highlight, but uh, blue works better for this. And you can't really see much detail in her eyes, but I do want to have a slight indication of, like, where her iris is versus the whites of the eyes. Something like that. I think the highlight is actually a little too large. Let me shrink that down a little bit. There we go. coolness, a little bit of purple back in the eyes there, the bags under the eyes. Questions. Uh, Alfred was wondering, did you use the writing method for this piece? Uh, no, no. Um, yeah, I just. Uh, I don't know if you saw the beginning, Alfred. Um, if you watch the beginning, I'll. Um, you can see the uh, process I used after doing lots and lots of thumbnail sketches was uh, I did a painted uh, block in basically to, to do the thumbnail sketch, and then I just did a tracing on top of that, like a freehand natural tracing, not a, not a Riley abstraction. I don't always use it, so it's it's one of the techniques I use, but it just depends on my mood and if I feel I really need to or not. 
That's always a good idea, probably, but I just, no, I didn't on this Yeah, method. I was going to ask, do you find yourself using the Riley method more, or like half the time, or less than half the time when you're drawing? Um, you know, I probably use it more than half the time uh, when I'm doing caricatures. And that's on a commission basis, not if you're live drawing someone. Yeah, that's only for studio pieces, yeah. If I'm doing live quick sketch caricatures, no, there's, there's no even pre-sketch usually. Just marker ink drawings, which is a whole different skill. So Hunter Jennings has a good question that we get asked a lot. So what is your best response when somebody wants art for free? <laughs> or they want you to draw them for free? Um, you know, if they say that in their initial email, I usually just ignore the email. <laughs> um, you know, oftentimes it's a particular case, like it's for a charity or someone who's recently passed on or something. Um, and, and sometimes those things are scams. So, you know, maybe they're contacting everyone, every artist they find on the web and they just want a free drawing of someone or, or of themselves. So, yeah. Um, I mean, if I feel like it's worth the time, I'll write them back and just say, I'm sorry, I don't do that, but here are my prices. And you, you never hear from them again, so I usually don't even bother. You know, if someone approaches you, though, like in person, that's another matter. You have to deal with them, you know. <laughs> and uh, just tell them, well, you know, you're a professional artist. Whether you are or not, you know, it doesn't matter. Just tell them you are. Um, and say, I'm sorry, you know, that's what I do for a living, so I need to, you know, I have a certain minimum price I use, and here's what I can do for you. So it's a good idea to have set prices in mind. Like I actually have a price list of the different types of artwork I do for people and I keep it in a file. In case I ever forget, I can just open up that file and you know refer to it in an email quote. Yeah. And the price usually turns people off, even if it's really cheap. So just charge what you want, you know, charge what you think it's worth. Um, Cause you know, the people that, you know, don't really value your skills, they're never going to pay anything pretty much. Yeah, I was uh, scrolling through Instagram today and there's this lady, I can't remember her name, but she has, you know, like 250,000 Instagram followers and everybody just loves her art. And so I went to check it out. And basically what she does is she takes other people's photos of celebrities and then draws on them. Hmm. Like she'll draw clothes or hearts or flowers and she is making a killing. <laughs> but in my mind, she doesn't have the permission to use those photos. They're not her photos. So I'm really confused by what people will pay for in this world. Yeah. And they'll get away with it until they don't. You know, if someone calls them on it, you know, might have to pay up or maybe they'll get sued or who knows. It's, it's not worth the risk. Another question for you, in painting teeth, do you go for a neutral palette or do you adjust the temperature in relation to the light source being reflected? Yeah, it's all, it's all related to the light source. I always base my decisions off of everything else I've done in the painting. If, if I think it's a cool light source or a warm light source, the teeth will have either a yellowish or a cool bluish grayish tint to them. Are you going to get to the teeth? You know, I, yeah, I was thinking about getting to the teeth today, actually. Um, I mean, the face, the upper part of the face isn't really nearly done, but it's definitely more completed than the lower part, so maybe I'll do a, something here. Um, probably want to finish these you know, lips here, this sort of dark reddish brown color for the lips.
You know, like, looking into this face, I keep on seeing Maya Rudolph. So, I mean, I, I don't know if it's just unconsciously I made her look a little like Maya Rudolph, who plays her on SNL, or if it's just that's really good casting because she kind of does look like Kamala. Mm, no, I don't think it looks anything like Maya Rudolph. Well, thank you. I mean, I guess that's a good thing, but I keep seeing it. Maybe you need to stop watching SNL. Maybe. About uh, seven minutes, unless you want to go a little longer today. Close to finishing. Um, Your call. Yeah, I don't know. I don't like to keep, have the stream run too long. It can be hard to watch someone paint, you know, for too long. But yeah, here I'm, I'm just laying in a base tone for the teeth here, just trying to cover up some of the line art. Um, going going darker than I would normally go, but it's it's it gets all about layering, I think. Um, and the colors of the teeth in the back here are really, really dark. The values, I should say. Maybe a little on the cool side. But I first try to teach uh, or treat the teeth as if they're sort of just a single cylindrical shape, shading from dark to light. And then when I squint down, I want to see that, you know, that realistic three-dimensional structure. You know, I don't worry about the divisions or the lines between the teeth. I just want to see that it's working three-dimensionally. And then I'll start working on smaller and smaller shapes. And then for the actual like lines between the teeth, all I need to do is just not paint light color there. You know, so the, the darker colors that were there for the teeth now just become the in-between colors between the teeth. There is quite a bit of contrast on these teeth here. Like it goes from dark to light relatively fast. But the darkest accents have to you have to really limit those. You can't go too crazy with them. And she actually has a bit of separation between her upper and lower teeth here. I think in the original photo I drew this from, her teeth were clenched together, but in this one her teeth are slightly parted, so it's gonna be a bit of a gap uh, between the upper and lower teeth here. Got a few more minutes if anyone wants to squeeze in a last minute question. Let's see if I can get a little more detail on these teeth here in the reference photo. Um, you can see that teeth generally have sort of an overall, like not as bright of a value as you generally think they do um, until you get to the actual highlight. So I'm just sort of gradually building up to that highlight shape, but the highlight's gonna be quite a bit lighter than any of the, uh, the base color of the teeth themselves. So 
So I do have one last question mm -hmm. from Hunter, but it really doesn't have anything to do with painting. Um, so he does some website design, and he's wondering if he should design his own website for business, or should he pay a different designer to do it? Hmm. Um, I don't know why you wouldn't do your own. I mean, Court did his own. Yeah, I did my <laughs> own, and I know nothing about web design. I mean, I don't know like technically anything about coding or anything. And I never studied the concepts behind good web design. I just looked at other sites that I liked and just tried to emulate that um, in a very simple way. I thought about the core values that were good that I wanted to have in a site, such as simplicity, ease of navigation, not having to make too many clicks to get where you want. Um, and also just the visual style that I wanted to show like about how my artwork is a little bit more refined you know so it has a bit of an elegant feel it's not I didn't go for the goofy cartoon aesthetic I went for a more like classical like traditional publishing look you know where it looks more like my, my front page of my website looks like the the book plate of a inside cover of a book maybe because I wanted to sort of hint at the idea that you know I'm you know, I, I do like uh, traditional illustrations for people. So, you know, so anyway, that was my guiding principle. Anyway, um, yeah, I don't know why you wouldn't do your own if you're if you're qualified to do websites. <laughs> it was not like cutting your own hair, um, which I do now because of the pandemic. Actually, and it doesn't turn out too bad. Did you cut your hair today? No, no, I was. I really, I didn't have time last night. I was going to cut it last night, but uh, I ran out of time because I Kamala kept giving me so much trouble. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'll cut it after this probably. I gotta make Debbie some lunch right after this, actually. Yeah, you owe me food. Yeah. I think we're gonna do stir fry today. Okay, so just about out of time here. Um, I got to do the teeth a little bit, anyway. They look good. Yeah, and everything's still really, sorry, still really rough. Uh, it's not, you know, it's got several more hours, but it's starting to look, it's starting to come out and look a little bit more believable. Feel kind of three-dimensional. The colors are still more intense than what's going on in this reference photo, but it is still partially a result of me looking at the original reference photo at the same time. So I'm going to have to reconcile that uh, in the rest of this painting, like figure out the lighting. You know, and if it is a combination of the both of them, lighting and color-wise, that's okay. As long as the painting looks good, as long as the painting looks convincing within, its, within the window of the canvas, I'm happy. It's, you know, no one's going to go back and check to see if it's accurate. It's just they're going to judge it if it looks if the values look good, if the edges look good, and if the colors have harmony. What's that? You're tiny. Oh, I'm tiny. Yeah. So, yeah, that's basically it. Let me switch back to the big view here. All right. Um, so, really uh, good uh, to see you guys today. Any last questions? Well, yeah. Oh, you know what? I didn't get a chance to do the hair, Hunter. Sorry about that. Uh, I just blocked it in the real simplistic of ways. Uh, but it's a good topic for a future live stream focusing on hair. I don't think I've actually focused on hair for a subject for a live stream. So yeah, that might be a good topic. So look out for that. Um, next week though, I might want to do something still election related. So uh, because it's the season for that. Uh, but uh, anyway, I want to thank you guys again for joining. Be sure to like and subscribe if you haven't done that. And any questions that I did not get to, please put them in the question in the comments below because uh, it's a lot easier for me to check afterwards to uh, see any questions I might have missed. Uh, thanks, Debbie, again, for your help. You're welcome. And we will see you guys next week. Bye. Bye.